Acho que não. Uh, you are all able to see the presentation, I understand. भाई आए थे भेजा नहीं भाई बिल ब्लीज डू दैट हैं Thank <laughs> you. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, Professor Prem, yeah, yeah. start. Yeah, yeah, please go ahead. All right. Uh, so, a very good morning to one and all present here in India and this part of the world. And good evening to those on the other side of the group. I'm Rekha Vig, Deputy Dean Academics and Professor in Computer Science and Engineering Department at the North Cap University, Gurgaon, India. Yeah. Hello. You lost your voice. Uh... <coughs> You've gone on mute. Yeah. Sorry, ma'am. Yeah. There was some issue here. Yeah, that's that's it. Really... So I, I extend a warm <laughs> welcome to our Pro Chancellor, Professor Prem Brat, mm. Vice Chancellor. Professor Nupur Prakash, Dr. Lena Booth, well, Senior you. Associate Dean of International Academic Partnership and Associate Professor of Finance at Thunderbird School of Global Management, ASU. A dean Academics, Professor Sora Nohuja. My dear faculty colleagues, both in this classroom and online, dear students of NCU and other international universities, and dear friends, we have gathered here to celebrate this milestone event of start of global classroom lecture series, which shall be conducted online today. <coughs> we are privileged to have the first lecture from Professor Premrath. However, this lecture was supposed to be conducted by uh, Dr. Sanjeev Khagram, the Dean of uh, Thunderbird School of Management at the Arizona State University. On his behalf, I would like to apologize that since he is not well and he's not able to speak at all, he has uh, requested for another date. So we shall have his lecture at another date. Today, we will have the lecture by Professor Premrath, sir. Uh, so uh, at the outset, please allow me to present a short introduction of the North Cap University to our <coughs> guest, uh, which will be followed by Dr. Uh, Professor Premrath's lecture. Just switch the slide. The North Cap University was founded in 1996 as Institute of Technology and Management to provide quality higher education to Indian students. It was upgraded to a university in 2010 as a private unaided university by government of Haryana. Over the last 25 years, the Institute has transformed into a multidisciplinary university in the field of engineering, management, law, and liberal arts. The university has a strength of around 3,000 students and an alumni base of more than 11,000. The School of Engineering and Technology at the North Cap University has been ranked among the top 100 engineering institutions across the country, securing 97th rank in All India NIRF ranking 2021. In addition, the NCU has achieved a perfect score of five stars in teaching, employability, academic development, online learning, and inclusiveness, and an overall rating of four stars in the QS star ranking ratings. The North Cap University has been accredited by NAC and ASIC UK. They accredited the university in the category of premier universities with commendable grades. NCU is known for its academic ambience, lush green surroundings, state-of-the-art infrastructure, cleanliness, outreach programs, international tie-ups, and vibrant academic culture. The university believes in the education, employment, empowerment, and enlightenment of all its students. So here we are, 
sitting in one of the newest state of the art classroom the smart classroom which boasts cutting edge video conferencing facilities that enable students to interact with teachers industry leaders and students from other universities via direct video links with ceiling mounted microphones microphones enabled cameras and the multiple digital screens for comfort viewing these classrooms would be used for regular classroom teaching online or remote faculty development programs and online training just give me a few seconds to show you the magic of this special classroom so how when i move from this particular side of the classroom and speak so the camera will follow my voice and direct towards me so you can see the view has changed from my end of the speaker to the classroom side and now if i move to the other end of the classroom how this how this microphone follows my voice and then tries to change the view of the classroom so this is the speciality of the classroom however being our first experience in this classroom uh, there could be certain issues and things may not go as smoothly as expected and i uh, ex uh, would apologize for any glitches that happen and excuse us for that uh so i understand that everyone is waiting to hear from professor premrath so uh, i'll just introduce him before he starts the lecture an outstanding academician professor premrath sir is pro chancellor professor of eminence and chief mentor at the north cap university gurugram which is formerly itm university he is chairman board of governors of iit dhanbad with additional charges chairman bog of iit mandi just prior to joining itmu as the vice chancellor in september 2011 he was professor of eminence at the management development institute mdi gurgaon professor brath was founder director of iit roorkee vice chancellor up technical university lucknow he is an honorary professor at iit delhi and distinguished adjunct professor at ait bangkok he is aic distinguished chair professor he was chairman board of governor wit dehradun a constituent institute of uttarakhand technological university he has guided more than 500 phd theses no 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 don't 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 miss 49 <laughs> sorry 50 phd theses 49 49 phd 118 mtech let's not introduce data which is not live i think we can move forward we are already in a, okay. in a okay, sorry, sir. yes sir please okay. over to you now Uh, thank you sir uh, good good morning i'll just move uh, to the uh, audience side so that uh, the camera starts facing the audience okay, okay. Uh, good morning and good good evening to the uh, participants from which are part of the world you are uh, uh, listening to me now obviously it's an unfortunate uh, uh, short term stop gap arrangement that in which i've been speaking but since uh, this is a topic uh, which has been uh, uh, of my interest for uh, uh, quite some time in fact uh, uh, in 2016 i had delivered a keynote address on the emerging paradigms of industry 4.0 at the jindal global university uh, in 2016 and uh, uh, after that in fact i have simply uh, just about two months back i have uh, in under my supervision a phd thesis has been submitted in iit delhi uh, on the uh, implementation road map Uh, and strategies for implementing industry 4.0 in indian manufacturing sector because you would know that uh, uh, many times the context in which we are working and the socio economic environment makes an impact whether a particular technological paradigm would work uh, effectively or not and uh, therefore it's a, if i just known some uh, had had some time so that i could collect my ppts perhaps i could have uh, uh, done a, uh, a better job but since i'm only uh, you know Uh, an apology to the uh, to the actually scheduled uh, lecture so i hope you'll bear with me now the term industry 4.0 uh, is itself is a very relatively new term it was in in fact in 2011 uh, that the term was coined in germany and uh, uh, even there it's still in the nascent stage but uh, the interesting feature of uh, this terminology is 
that so much debate has taken place in India and Industry 4.0 that perhaps the rest of the world wouldn't have. And it's only during the pandemic that there has been uh, a slowdown of this debate. And therefore, this is a topic which India has extensively been uh, uh, you know, uh, following up. A large number of conferences, uh, keynote addresses that I have delivered at the conferences on the relevance of Industry 4.0. In that background, I wish to share that the term Industry 4.0 primarily is the fourth industrial revolution. So obviously a logical uh, question would be that uh, uh, there must be previously three industrial revolutions. That's why the fourth one. And therefore roughly as per the concept of Industry 4.0, uh, 1760 to 1840 uh, ushered in the mechanical production, railways and steam engine. That's in, known as industrial first, first industrial revolution. 1870 to 1940, when we talked about the mass production system, balanced assembly lines, electricity and assembly lines, uh, uh, mass production system is roughly attributed to industry 2.0. Yeah. From yeah. 1960 to 2010, that means about uh, uh, 10, 11 years back, the, the, this reason I said, uh, 1960 to uh, 2010, with the um, uh, advent of computers, semiconductors, uh, mainframe computing, personal devices and internet. Involvement of all these things is, is, is given the name industry, uh, third industrial revolution. And the fourth industrial revolution, which is the topic of uh, discussion today, is primarily involving uh, the management of cyber physical systems, where machines, components, because of the nine emerging technological paradigms, uh, where uh, due to internet of things, cloud computing, big data analytics, collaborative robots, uh, uh, then the, the, the blockchain uh, 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 and decision support system, 3D printing, all these nine emerging pa technological paradigms is what con uh, generally constitutes Industry 4.0. And therefore, uh, obviously, it has uh, uh, led to an enormous amount of debate and discussions because uh, here we talk about uh, uh, virtual reality, augmented reality, artificial in intelligence, uh, digital twin where you almost simulate the uh, a, a parallel of an enterprise and keep on doing experimentation on it digital twin is into one of the very important implications of industry 4.0 and therefore as a result these nine emerging uh, technological paradigms which roughly uh, is known as the uh, cyber physical systems and therefore managing uh, production systems and service systems of in the context of cyber physical systems uh, with the help of these nine emerging technologies is roughly uh, what is known as industry 4.0. And as I mentioned that even in developed world, uh, it's, it's still an emerging paradigm. You can quite imagine that uh, when even in Germany, it started in 2011, but it's been picked up by the developing and developed world so much enormously. And interestingly or ironically, India seems to have taken an out of uh, a turn interest in industry 4.0, uh, so much so that in last uh, uh, five to six years that I have seen, almost every uh, every conference uh, was eventually subtitled in the context of Industry 4.0, so much so that in one of the conferences of industrial engineering, uh, I had actually uh, uh, delivered a valedictory address in Bhuneshwar. There was a panel discussion that I was chairing with top men. There was a person from the, 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 uh, the, the Director General of Police of Odisha said, Police 4.0, Education 4.0, Quality 4.0, industrial 4.0, it seems to have become a cliche. And therefore, for that reason, I, I thought of uh, uh, you know, undertaking a research, and that, that's the genesis of why I started guiding a PhD thesis. Uh, since you already know that I'm already an honorary professor in United Delhi, where still I teach and write research. This thesis has been submitted uh, about two months back, is, uh, is undergoing uh, 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 the examination, uh, you know, as we have the foreign examination as well as in Indian. But we have published about six papers internationally. And the theme of that was, while this so much has been talked about Industry 4.0, in the context of socioeconomic background of developing countries such as India, which is enormous amount of uh, relatively uh, uh, least, uh, less expensive uh, uh, labor available. And they put which dimensions of Industry 4.0? Because looking at expecting Indian uh, you know, so socioeconomic milieu, to, to switch over to Industry 4.0 overnight. And this I would say even for any developing country, because there are enormous amount of resource implications 
in switching over to industry 4.0 in its totality. A and to that extent, perhaps even, uh, in fact, uh, not many developed countries have fully switched over to industry 4.0. So the point we I I'm making, while the message is good, but it needs to be very consciously taken care of because there are enormous amount of challenges that uh, industry 4.0 uh, implementation has. And it's with that background, I must also mention that the government of India, Ministry of Heavy Industries, had uh, uh, contracted me uh, as, a mem as a chairman of a three-member team to develop an implementation policy for government of India uh, for the implementation of industry 4.0 in Indian context. Uh, we had a deliberations. In fact, there was a professor from IC Bangalore, and there is an, a managing director of a, 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 a small uh, entrepreneurs in Elements Fire to Delhi, and under my chairmanship. So we deliberated and eventually given a roadmap of implementing Industry 4.0 in Indian context, given the socio-economic background and the resource uh, and the current level of technology uh, and and the various other issues and challenges, uh, where we are given a roadmap. Uh, how in the Indian context, uh, this particular uh, emerging industrial paradigm uh, can be made. Obviously, there are some very uh, strong points in its favor. Obviously, there are major limitations uh, to switch over to Industry 4.0 in a relatively immediate term future. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm saying the Indian context, that's where the, and therefore uh, this actually led to an evolution of a national policy. Uh, it, it was a recommendation from my committee uh, whether it has uh, eventually become a policy document is yet to be seen, where we have suggested that there are some very strong low-hanging fruits uh, in these nine technologies of the Industry 4.0, which indeed we should be able to make use of them quickly. But over a period of time, and in, 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 in my recommendation, in my committee's recommendation, we believe that perhaps by 2040, that means another uh, around two decades from now, Indian economy uh, and institutions and industry would perhaps would be in a fairly preparedness, re ready to uh, implement almost the uh, major dimensions or all dimensions of Industry 4.0. And therefore, this staggered roadmap of implementation, including the date lines that by, by 2025, by 2030, by 2035, by 2040. And this indeed uh, was a major outcome of, uh, of that study. I'd made a presentation before the secretary uh, heavy industries, government of India. This is just before corona, corona period. And therefore, the point I'm making, India was going in a big way, uh, absolutely enthusiastically uh, uh, about Industry 4.0. The break came through the pandemic. And the pandemic has further uh, eroded uh, uh, you know, the, uh, the situation very substantially. Maybe that a new policy document might become necessary because of a transformational change in the socioeconomic background uh, of, of this pandemic. Now, let's look at... Uh, what are the major uh, plus and minus points today? <laughs> For example, some of the very important uh, in Industry 4.0 uh, deals with, for example, Internet of Things, where uh, machines talk to each other, machines are interconnected, components talk to each other, Internet of Industrial Things. Now, it's an extremely wonderful thing because with the help of Internet of Things, so much uh, real-time monitoring of systems can take place. Similarly, uh, uh, Artificial intelligence, now I'm talking of those low-hanging fruits, which can be almost immediately uh, taken care of. Uh, artificial intelligence, in fact, artificial intelligence, all this one of the nine technological subsystems of industry 4.0, but it's not a new term. It was coined somewhere around 1955, because primarily we are using artificial intelligence to try to make it, mimic the human brain uh, and bring that degree of uh, artificial intelligence in, in machines on computers so that with the help of algorithms, they're able to mimic how the human uh, mind works and are able to take a decision based on that. And therefore, I believe that artificial intelligence can be one such low-hanging fruit uh, within the uh, nine technological subsystems of Industry 4.0 that Indian industries and uh, organizations must. And this can be done without huge amount of technological investment uh, required. Whereas there are some, uh, uh, like, for example, collaborative robots or robotics. Uh, robotics and collaborative robots, I call them cobots, mm -hmm. itself uh, uh, might be perhaps given uh, on a back burner because in Indian context, perhaps uh, we have to make use of robotics in a very calculated, carefully uh, curated manner because uh, 
there are negative implications of industry 4.0 maybe in terms of the potential employment for example where uh, some of the developed countries which are having maybe negative population growth there is an acad tremendous shortage of talented manpower perhaps mm -hmm. robotics as a replacement of people on the uh, in the shop floor might be a, a, a feasible option but in indian context perhaps we'd have to uh, cautiously make use of the robotics in those hazardous areas where human uh, would not like to be deployed where very unsafe working conditions so therefore we have to make a very calculatedly careful uh, applications of uh, 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 of, of robotics or collaborative now collaborative robots robots is when robots talk to each other now here i would like to uh, to mention now it'll be very ironical in indian context when machine talk to each other robots talk to each other but people don't talk to each other even in the same room they exchange memos to talk to each other now what kind of uh, disconnect we uh, we would have in industry 4.0 when people are talking through memos and machines are talking directly to each other and robots are talking to each other robots are collaborating but people are competing instead of collaborating and therefore these are the some of the dysfunctional disconnects that we need to uh, really address in in dealing with the uh, uh, issues and therefore in this context i believe that some of the very uh, easily uh, uh, in a, for example virtual reality uh, art, uh, augmented reality uh, artificial intelligence digital twin digital twin is a wonderful concept where you are able to replace an enterprise digitally so that any amount of policy experimentation in a simulated manner can be directly uh, actually conducted on the digital twin twin without directly impacting uh, the real life uh, uh, policies and decisions and they put uh, concepts like digital twin uh, augmented reality virtual reality uh, blockchain blockchain is another one of the very powerful and i'm happy to say that blockchain uh, is in, in fact taking traction in this country because blockchain or uh, uh, or the you know uh, decentralized uh, you know ledger technology uh, is an extremely emerging uh, concept in the context of industry 4.0 because with the help of black blockchain you are able to ensure the uh, that nobody can fiddle with the data the data uh, Uh, sort of uh, you know reliability credibility of the data cannot be fiddled with and they put banking uh, many banks in the country particularly the state bank of india uh, is showing enormous impact uh, interest in making use of the uh, blockchain technology and they put blockchain is another very powerful emerging uh, uh, concept in, uh, in in the context then big data analytics now these are the strength point of indian because you know indian uh, you know very good in developing algorithms very good in mathematical modeling very good in developing inference and engine and, and they put uh, big data analytics is another very powerful way, which indeed builds upon the already the data uh, uh, you know information system or management information system or decision support system with the help of uh, enormous amount of data that gets generated both quantitative and qualitative data and they put the big data analytics makes use of enormous amount of and filter out with the help of uh, data mining data warehousing uh, as a result some very important uh, because as you know that data and information becomes a raw material for decision making and therefore with the help of big data analytics is possible for indian managers to make more informed decisions incorporating both structured and unstructured data incorporating both qualitative and quantitative data and that's where enormous amount of benefits of the big data analytics Uh, uh, can help us now therefore uh, it tremendous has uh, as uh, applications but now coming to uh, in the doctor uh, research that uh, i have guided what we have studied and i must tell you it's an enormous amount of uh, mathematical modeling and techniques that we have made use of in that you know paper we have tried to find out the barriers and enablers of implementing industry 4.0 in indian context for manufacturing sector and therefore there are uh, a large number of barriers because unless you are able to identify the barriers to recognize a weakness is a first step in improvement and therefore in that uh, study we have identified those barriers and try to uh, prioritize them using uh, some of the systems analysis techniques so that unless we overcome these barriers the implementation of an industry 4.0 would not be effectively done then we have also identified enablers what needs to be done as a part of the policy uh, instrument in terms of creating a industry 4.0 platform what kind of technological platform is required 
and therefore enablers and barriers have been identified and in the process some of the challenges that uh, need to be addressed are for example the it since the entire industry 4.0 primarily it's it driven almost I, it is a, is almost a, 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 is an a, is a fuel in all that you do in in that I talked about in the current situation in indian context where the it penetration in the rural sector is, is not in more than 2% where the the reliability and data uh, the reliability of the internet services the credibility the data security the cyber frauds is uh, the cyber security dimensions are of extreme uh, in, uh, you know concern so unless we fix up those barriers and take care of uh, creating a a kind of a very safe cyber world because in a cyber physical system you have two subsystem the cyber system and a physical system physical systems are the machines and equipment and cyber systems are the internet and if, unless we are able to create a very credible reliable cyber system uh, free from any stresses and strains uh, of the cyber fraud and the non availability of the connectivity uh, and therefore as a result uh, we need to really put in uh, uh, the need to uh, maintain integrity of our production processes integrity of our, uh, our internet and the reliability of the internet uh, right now and not, not only the the penetration even the reliability of the internet connections across the country it might be good in some places but across the country it's still uh, uh, a lot needs to be done then we need to uh, uh, for example imagine if these nine technologies uh, which constitute cyber physical systems our current engineering institutions particularly the private engineering colleges which constitute 85% of the total btech programs they don't even talk about industry 4.0 uh, as a subject and they put the major challenge is, is what kind of skill sets the industry 4.0 paradigms requires a totally different kind of skill sets different types of technological know how and therefore this enormous need uh, almost on a war footing to create that kind of skill set and fortunately our university in ncu has taken a major decision in that direction because some of the uh, in fact uh, almost many of these uh, a uh, technological emerging paradigms of industry 4.0 we have taken initiative in introducing courses of uh, of that kind we have courses on internet of things we have course on uh, in fact uh, uh, cyber security uh, uh, and artificial intelligence and so on and therefore at a national level lot more needs to be done in training people because unless you have people available uh, to develop these technologies now, uh, uh, therefore that's a challenge to, uh, data security data reliability internet connectivity and then the major investment required uh, cyber systems and physical systems fortunately cyber systems may not require huge amount of investment but physical systems having a uh, collaborative robots a state of the art machines equipment or or complete automation or totally automatic uh, automatic machines completely a uh, zero man factory uh, a smart factory completely the factories which the machines which will itself doing self healing machines will be able to do uh, diagnostics prevent a failure to take place and that degree of technology requires huge amount of investment in technological system right now indian investment in education particularly the technical education indian investment in research and development uh, is not adequate to think that in the very short run will be able to have a completely automated systems uh, and autonomous machines and uh, and totally uh, full proof systems of uh, uh, you know the the poka uk system so even by mistake you cannot commit a mistake and therefore those are the uh, challenges uh, that investment huge amount of investment required in technology and equipment of latest equipment and unfortunately if we invest uh, uh, in the technology of uh, industry 4.0 most of these equipments would have to be imported from outside because indian industries indian manufacturing sector has not yet invested in producing uh, machines or equipment uh, you know of the kind required in an industry 4.0 environment and therefore as a result that's why i have re uh, advised a very uh, cautiously uh, staggered approach in implementing uh, industry 4.0 in indian context till we prepare ourselves simultaneously and therefore uh, in order to prepare ourselves we need to prepare uh, a develop a standard industry 4.0 implementation uh, platform which we have recommended then we have created an infrastructure of a large across the whole country a, a mass scale in uh, 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 training of skills uh, of people 
because people have to unlearn their conventional technological skills and relearn. And for that, you require a huge amount of, uh, you know, skill development programs for which a, a network based uh, in a hybrid infrastructure uh, ha has been recommended in that report. And therefore, till then, we adopt those uh, 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 immediate, uh, uh, low hang as I called in, a long, low hanging fruit, but also be cautious. The negative side effects of this can be almost catastrophic. For example, at times it would mean a huge amount of investment in uh, in cyber physical systems, which right now, because industry 4.0 presumes that we are already there in, in 3.0. But if you really see the gross, gross reality, 92% uh, of the unorganized sector that India has, and the small and medium enterprises, uh, in fact, the current level of technology, since I had conducted a, a consulting uh, assignment of, uh, you know, evaluating the impact of uh, Unido's uh, contribution in developing SMEs in, by the uh, the the, the uh, Ministry of Heavy Industry. In fact, based on uh, on my report of uh, of that uh, uh, Unido's uh, contribution, uh, they again hired me for this purpose. So I believe that right now our small and medium enterprises in India, the technological level is so low that in small and medium enterprises, even uh, even right now, even computers are not fully employed. Even right now, they write on a blackboard the daily production target, actual so much, produce so much and the attendance is taken and therefore this will take quite some time of investment change of mindsets and huge amount of so first we need to come to uh, the industry third industrial revolution to be effectively learned in india and only obviously you can't uh, leapfrog very su suddenly so to me it's a great concept it has some very strong points but we need to have exercise an element of caution and patience in its implementation simply you know, uh, if, if the concept comes like a storm, it will also go like a storm. And those, therefore, I, I believe that we need to be very careful. And in that context, I believe that the research study that uh, I have supervised in Delhi and, and the, uh, the, the, uh, the policy framework for uh, implementing Industry 4.0 in Indian context that I've given to the government of India through Minister of Heavy Industry, obviously addresses these issues in a very detailed manner. And therefore, I'm able to speak uh, out of, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, sudden notice without. But if I had known this, perhaps I could have given a more informed, uh, uh, you know, reasons uh, in the process of uh, how we need to be very cautious. But uh, as I said, blockchain technology uh, is a very emerging technology, but it uh, calls for uh, making crypto uh, uh, a currency as a legal uh, 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 money. Right now, Indian government has not allowed uh, 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 cryptocurrency to become a legal document, uh, a legal uh, financial transaction, and therefore there are there are uh, 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 roadblocks, which obviously every every road roadblock can be overcome. Uh, but then uh, we are moving in the right direction, and I believe if uh, this pandemic wasn't there, our movement of Industry 4.0, given the enthusiasm, so much so that. Even police, I've in fact, I've been told that person that when you talk of police 4.0, please make it 1.0 first because the kind of uh, the, the equipment and facilities they have and the mindset and therefore uh, simply blindly adopting a concept won't do. It has to be taken in the conscious context in which we are implementing it. Given the fact that India is a developing country, it has resource limitations. It is rich in manpower, which is relatively uh, easily available. And therefore, if it leads to loss of uh, employment, suppose we do everything, uh, uh, robotics, uh, everything completely uh, automated factories and uh, robots will be controlling, although there are benefits uh, uh, going for robots, when it comes to hazardous functioning, when you're doing underwater uh, welding, when you're uh, addressing uh, in a hazardous environment, let, let robots do the job instead of uh, putting, uh, because there are human, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, rights issues involved, but using robots where people are available to do the job. And in any case, uh, and I've been a very strong votary of that, any amount of artificial intelligence will not replace real intelligence. Therefore, while we make use of these concepts to enrich the human mind, to enrich the human uh, uh, you know, uh, capabilities, the human power, the human talent, the human knowledge, so that uh, these technologies as enablers must empower the people 
to do their job better, faster, cheaper, uh, cheaper, safer. And so long as it leads to that conclusion, uh, this is a very powerful emerging paradigm. But needs to be we need to prepare our grounds very well before uh, we launch into it. Otherwise, uh, we'll, right now we are talking about the potential of Industry 4.0. Later on, we'll be writing papers on the why it failed. So why can't we be cautious in adopting it so that we don't have to write failure stories later on? And therefore, this is where perhaps we feel uh, that this topic definitely deserves uh, to be deliberated. Uh, but a very cautious approach, given the resource context, I'm talking the Indian context, American context could be different, German context could be different, Japanese context could be different, because there, uh, perhaps uh, uh, robotics might be required to replace people, because they don't have many. And, and there's, there's a negative population growth in some of the parts of the Europe. And therefore, in our case, if I uh, man as, uh, if I put a person uh, uh, without a job, and a, a robo, robo uh, ask him to do the, uh, replaces him, this person would have adequate nuisance power to destroy the robo. Because we have to look at the law and order and the, uh, and the repercussions that when a person is without a job because of a robo, he might destroy the robo first because he, uh, robo becomes an uh, enemy to him. And therefore, in that context, we need to be carefully addressing these issues. Uh, I have tried to uh, share Professor Nupur uh, whatever uh, off the cuff I could speak on the topic, and I, I hope that uh, you know it, it is of some uh, uh, use to uh, the the, the uh, uh, audience in this. I'll be very happy to respond to any questions and uh, is issues that you might be having on this. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much, sir, for such an enlightening and informative talk, uh, and that too at such a short notice. You have spoken so well and given all the aspects. Uh, around industry 4.0 and all the you also talked about various bottlenecks roadblocks in adopting industry 4.0 sir i have a question to you yeah. Yeah, and that is in india we are expecting that the launch of 5g mobile technologies mm -hmm. will fuel the growth of industry 4.0 Mm -hmm. And this will be done by enabling unprecedented degrees of flexibility, productivity, mm -hmm. and automation in industrial manufacturing. Yeah, true. But sir, as you said, that even the 4, 4G technology is yeah. not yet matured in India. That's true. And That's the true. launch of 5G mobile services in India is around the corner. Yeah. And you must have also heard about the news of several Air India flights getting yeah, cancelled to the US true. because of 4, 5G, 5G interfering with the yeah, airline right. system. Yeah, that's true. That's so true. how do we reap the benefits? Yeah, I, I actually, I you see, I, I must, uh, I mean, of course, what I was saying is my personal view. See, very frequent gen change of generations uh, sometimes may be a designed uh, obsolescence. Many times the the computer industries are very good in design, uh, in, in having designed obsolescence. You'd have, you know, version one, version two, version three, version four of the software, and to make it so that, uh, the, uh, you know, although many times the, the the machine may, my computer, my laptop may really not be that outdated, but is perhaps by design is uh, uh, is made outdated because a particular software doesn't run on it. The same way, I believe that uh, uh, this. Uh, 1G, 2G, 3G, 4G, 5G is running almost parallel. Now, 5G uh, uh, to me is yet to, there are some major concerns. One of them you have mentioned, one major concern, and of course, this is where I read somewhere, I, I do not vouch for its authenticity. There's some major environmental concern in terms of the uh, the kind of the, uh, 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 the waves it generates on, on the human health. In fact, there's, I think the German uh, professor has uh, warned against the use of uh, uh, 5G uh, because of the... In fact, somebody, of course, I don't believe in those gossips. They say that sometimes he tried to prove that countries which are adopting 5G are more impacted by Corona compared to those countries which are not adopting uh, 5G. But these are these may be gossips. But your point is very valid that we must, before we launch to the next generation... And this is what I said even in the uh, industry 4.0 context, because to my mind, Indian industry has not matured third industrial revolution fully, particularly the small and medium sector, where even 
ordinary computerization, low cost automation has not been fully resorted to. This is based on my, my study that I visited number of companies uh, uh, under this UNIDO uh, uh, you know, uh, evaluation exercise. And therefore, as a result, to me, we first mature uh, ourselves in 4G. And not only that, we first ensure a, a very reliable internet availability. Uh, we ensure cyber security so that I don't feel uneasy in make example, uh, even uh, a person like me uh, feels very uneasy in doing internet banking. I almost have disabled my internet banking. I do not use ATM very extensively. So given the kind of potential fear of the cyber fraud, your entire earning of lifetime can be uh, knocked out if you by mistake uh, give, uh, give one OTP to somebody. And since the cyber crooks are far, far ahead of this, uh, the, the, the uh, uh, you know, the uh, normal people, we have to take these concepts. So while you ensure that there are no, because any, any positive development must be without any, if the side effects are worse than the main effect, it's better not to go for the main effect because side effects cannot be ignored. And therefore, cautiously, while we march forward, and that's why a slow and steady runs the, uh, wins the race to me, uh, adopt a concept if it fits into a social economic milieu. But if it does not, for example, to me, the cyber security issue, cyber crime issue in India seems to have taken a much major center stage, which indeed is going to impact uh, the journey of computerization uh, or automation substantially. Because, uh, in fact, I remember in uh, uh, a single person can hack the entire examination system. So therefore, when you're so much dependent, unless we develop, uh, you know, contingency, contingency plans, unless we ensure that our entire data cannot be knocked off by somebody uh, uh, playing tricks, and therefore, uh, we need to address, and this is where I have I've been trained in my life, look at a problem in its totality, systems thinking or systems approach to decision making. To me, when we address issues of technology industry 4.0, this is one technology, but if you look at its adoption and the rate of adoption in Indian context, you have to look at a problem in its totality because systems approach calls for looking at a problem from technological perspective, uh, from economic perspective, from financial perspective, from human resources perspective, from, uh, from administrative perspective, from uh, political perspective, from demographic perspective, from modeling perspective. And they put all these perspectives together including both the main effect and side effect. So that in net, by adjusting for the net, uh, you know, succeeding uh, with a much worse, uh, you know, side effect is no succeeding. And therefore, this calls for a holistic integrated approach before you accept or reject. Same thing I would suggest with uh, the 5G technology. Look at the 5 technology in its totality. To me, it is just yet emerging. It's technologically, it's not it's still, you cannot say that, uh, uh, you know, 5G technology has already emerged as a stabilized technology. And they were still in, for example, IIT Delhi has a lab on 5G and we are still experimenting. To me, uh, perhaps uh, uh, 4G needs to be stabilized. Internet penetration in the country, in the rural sector, where 70% people, uh, live, there are only 2% penetration of internet there. And there even 2G doesn't, uh, you know, uh, is not there. So let's look at that. And to me, uh, 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 my concern many times is, which I've been saying, and I'm very frank in saying, many times in India, we get governed by the push given by outside people from outside India. Industry 4.0, 5G might also be an example of this kind. Uh, and therefore, while we accept any great idea, we need to cautiously adapt in our situation. Every country does it in its own interest. But I cannot do something that doesn't fit in into my national interest right now. It doesn't give me the kind of resources that are required because there's a huge amount of resources required in implementing uh, the nine technological subsystems. Do I need all of them? Can I afford to have all of them? Would they all be relevant for me? I need to be cautiously uh, adapting this and therefore a greater degree of debate participation across the country is useful before we evolve uh, 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 an approach. So to me, I share your, uh, uh, your view that uh, before 5G, to me, I, I say going for, you see, these are maybe the, as, as I use the word, designed obsolescence. Designed obsolescence is 
you make the previous version obsolete so that the people would buy the new version. It was happening in automobile sector. Uh, uh, it was happening in computer sector. It was happening in software development sector. And uh, perhaps it might even happen in education sector. You make some of the, uh, the old, uh, you know, uh, time-tested wisdom uh, concepts outdated because all that was taught in uh, you know, our old traditional uh, knowledge is not outdated. We need to adapt, adapt what is relevant. Some of the foundations of uh, old knowledge and traditional knowledge would be uh, time invariant. So let's, uh, let's avoid the possibility of having designed obsolescence and fall prey to it. And once we are cautious about it, we'll adopt these policies very carefully. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Now, Thank I you, would sir. request uh, Dr. Yeah, yeah. Rekha to take questions from the audience. Yes, yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And uh, we have certain questions from the audience present here. I would yeah. like to uh, 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 ask the audience to please uh, uh, close with the questions. Yeah. Good morning, one and all present here. And yes. uh, sir, it was quite a realization listening to the concerns that you have raised about, uh, regarding the Industrial Revolution 4.0. My question to you would be that we often say that sustainability and industrial revolution 4.0 are intermingled. Uh, mm -hmm. What according to you could be the stumbling blocks on our way with industrial revolution 4.0, particularly keeping environment and health at uh, yeah, this, the background? Uh, actually, this uh, this was one, one of the dimensions that you mentioned. I was talking about the doctor research that I did. Sustainability dimension was also an uh, a comp uh, See, here we look at sustainability uh, uh, not merely environmental point of view, the, 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 the economic sustainability, the social sustainability, and the environmental sustainability. Uh, all the three concerns are important. And therefore here, uh, uh, while addressing these social, environmental, and economic, for example, unless this uh, uh, technology, Industry 4.0, makes our local products globally competitive, that means if I can make my local products globally competitive so that the rest of the world would rush towards Indian products because they offer value for money, because you have to understand to remain globally competitive, you must make quality at a lower cost. And therefore, flexibility, productivity, quality, uh, all these are. So if it helps in that direction, great. But when the amount of investment required is so huge in the beginning, when the technological know-how does not exist, where people are not trained, do you think that by adopting these technologies, you can make your products globally competitive? So not in the short run. So sustainability issue is extremely vital because when we adopt a technology, we and I'm, I'm, I'm going beyond your environmental sustainability. I'm talking about the social uh, sustainability. Uh, can, for example, if Industry 4.0 throws most of my uh, people out of job, would it not create a social disorder in the society? And therefore, social, is it socially sustainable? Is it economically sustainable? Can I afford the kind of investment it calls for? Can I create robust systems of technology uh, which it calls for? And what are the positive and negative? Of course, uh, you know, by making use of clean technologies, green technologies, we can to some extent contain the, uh, the, the negative environmental uh, you know, degradation of uh, you know, emerging uh, technologies of this kind. But it calls for investment. And therefore, a very carefully considered uh, social cost benefit analysis, even for sustainability needs to be taken care of. And some of these issues we've addressed uh, in that research. Okay. Can we have the next question? Puja? Yeah. Sir, so how will this fourth industrial revolution empower people to upskill themselves? Now, of course, it provides an opportunity. For example, conventional skills will, will not do. You need to be digital uh, savvy. You need to have. You need to understand. Uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, computers. You need to understand algorithms. You need to understand. Uh, uh, and therefore, the opportunity it provides you for upskilling is that if you do not upskill yourself, you may not have relevance. And therefore, uh, you you are compelled to upskill yourself. And to that extent, it could be seen as an opportunity because uh, it's an enormous opportunity to prepare ourselves. And since India, and that's where I find is a great opportunity. Now, this way, maybe I can I can bring out the concept of, of what's known as a demographic dividend. Maybe to uh, people outside India who may be listening to me, this term may not be very common. Uh, our Honorable Prime Minister has 
uh, has been using this term for quite some time. India has the demographic dividend. Now, what does it mean? And I'm, I'll link your answer to that question, that 55% of Indians are less than 25 years of age. So India is the youngest nation in the world. Now, seen in the context where the developed world is relatively developed world is aging. Europe is aging, America is aging, Japan is aging, and these people are highly technological dependent uh, countries. So extend this time uh, horizon. Ten years from now, when already such an aging population in, in Japan, in, in America, in Europe, from where will they get the talented technical manpower? Because of the demographic dividend potential of India, if these young people, we can make them globally employable, and they put, if these people can be made globally employable because of the de demographic dividend, the whole world would rush towards India in search of people because they would badly need people to man their, uh, their telephone system, they man their transportation system, their computer system, uh, their, their powerhouses. And this calls for enormous opportunity uh, to upskill our uh, young people that 55% of Indians being less than 25%, that's an age of learning. And therefore, it's a great opportunity to upskill and learn these emerging technologies because even if you do not, may not use them in India for the moment, if you're good in these concepts, the whole world would be looking to hire you. And therefore, from learning point of view, I believe it's a great opportunity to train our people uh, in these emerging uh, uh, technologies so that we make our a young Indian population globally employable, and that will be a great uh, demographic dividend. And they put in that context, the opportunities are enormous, huge opportunities. We need to really, this to my mind is a low hanging fruit to start developing a passionately trained manpower uh, in upskilling them for implementing uh, technology driven management of cyber fiscal systems effectively, uh, uh, because it may take some time here, but this will be required in, in developed world and you'd be required there because uh, the population is aging there. So it's, it's a great opportunity to learn. And here, there should be no limit. Absolutely, go in a big way, train people, but then make them globally employable. When I say globally employable, they should, apart from technological skill and knowledge, should also have the right attitude and values of honesty, integrity, Timeliness, punctuality, because as you know, uh, if, if, if the one simple uh, you know, difference that I found in a developed uh, country and developing country, in developed world, everybody's punctual. In, in Japan, the lateness of a train is measured in two seconds. They put, when I say globally employable, develop not only knowledge and skill, but the values, attitudes, and flexibility to assimilate in a different culture, adopt their languages, respect their culture, so that uh, if you develop yourself globally employable, the whole world went in search of Indians in search of those jobs. To me, therefore, this is a huge opportunity to grow and develop. Thank you, sir. Uh, there's a question from a student here who's online. Mm -hmm. Is society ready to face the biggest challenge of unemployment that Industry 4.0 will give rise to and which already is a glaring problem in many developing yeah. countries yeah. like India? That, that, that's, that's why, that's why I, I, I raised that issue because one of the social issue that I mentioned. So that's why I'm putting, uh, replacing uh, people with machine is not in my agenda in the short run. Yes. Using uh, computers, using internet, using algorithms, using artificial intelligence, using uh, blockchain technologies, using digital, using this to empower people. So what we need, we, we should not replace, think of replacing people. We must think of empowering them so their productivity improves, you double their productivity, triple their productivity, so that they're able to uh, make better jobs, uh, better quality jobs at a much lower cost, uh, which are safer, faster, cheaper. And therefore, in that context, we need to empower people, not replace the employment, as I already mentioned. The moment society uh, remains employable, uh, uh, unemployed, and the factory runs automatically with robots, It'll be a very severe law and order because actually I remember, in fact, it's a very, in IIT Delhi, maybe some 30 years back, our Indian mind, see, we, we developed a, uh, we bought a photocopy machine in my department. Uh, that I'm talking some 35, 40 years back. 
my 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 pn had to therefore had an additional task that a lot of people okay photocopy kar dena photocopy and this fellow thought that this machine is going to come so he saw to it that within few days that machine became in operational and the person was uh, saved of doing too much of work so the moment we think of replacing people their employment they might actually uh, make the robots in un- operational yes, they might uh, uh, play with the, some security measures to me therefore all the technologies are for the good of mankind this is how asme defines it in engineering a conscious application of science for the good of mankind so the entire technological innovation must be for the good of mankind if it is at the cost of the mankind i think i'll discard the technology first i will respect the mankind and that's where i'll uh, i'll look at it so therefore for empowerment empowerment for enhancing their productivity for making them more capable to deliver better quality goods at a much lower cost and gaining gaining employment should be the objective through these technologies not losing and one way of gaining employment is upskill yourself in such a big way so that you become globally employable so even if not in india you might be required in a big way elsewhere and uh, in the meantime india should also prepare its, itself in terms of its ground so that we also make use of good features of industry 4.0 and we'll also uh, you know make use of it to the extent is possible so they put they, uh, you know uh, sky is the limit for upskilling and uh, uh, technical uh, education and know how in, in this emerging uh, field this is almost a prerequisite for its implementation right sir thank you sir should not lead to uh, lead to unemployment absolutely be catastrophic uh, sir we have uh, on the similar lines we have a question from uh, fernanda vagara bonilla from uag mexico he is asking what will happen to the human factor that does not reach the level of demand of fourth revolution due to economic inequalities yeah that's true see e- economic inequality uh, itself would have its that's why i i'm i'm presuming that you know uh, you know when we talk of industry 4.0 it will be very naive to think that the entire industry and all industries in the country will be industry 4.0 maybe some sectors like for example automobile sector or uh, original equipment manufacturing could uh, could get into that there will be still be uh, some companies or some industries will be still working in the uh, old traditional manner so depending upon your skill capabilities you should be employable for the skill that you have and i believe that uh, uh, these transformations are not uh, across the board overnight they'll be still as staggered they'll be they put if your skill level is not matching the needs of the industry 4.0 you'll be relevant for uh, those sectors where uh, which have yet not adopted industry 4.0 because they are not prepared so there'll be skill required for that for every skill there should be a job that's my way of looking at it for all kinds of skill there should be a job because is is our responsibility as the uh, uh, as a nation to engage people purposefully to the extent they are capable of while we perpetually keep on developing their skills but we should find an alternative job for doing that because if a person remains uh, you know without a job uh, perhaps it can be catastrophic for the society in general because i believe that even in the developed world for example in india losing a job was kind was thought to be extremely stressful and it still uh, it still is but i have seen even in the developed world when on friday they expect a pink slip people do develop uh, blood pressure some the kinds of effort losing a job is not a great idea in any con- uh, context uh, developed or under developed so we must not uh, uh, create society for losing jobs we must create society for engaging people to the capable their own capabilities of human mind so that the mind heart and hands are integrate integrally used in 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 contributing to a better world and if people even with lower skills would have a job for them or should have a job to them i i'm i'm not a strong votary of creating a society where people with lower skill because for every person there exists a job for every kind of a person uh, there exists a job or there should exist a job but our use of technology should be that we must make that job or whatever job he does uh, free from drudgery free from burden and uh, Uh, make uh, uh, you know it's safer and he enjoys doing it and that's the to me every technology only an enabling factor it enabled all technologies are enabled let's enable men power to do a better job or whatever they are capable of doing so uh, uh, against uh, uh, unemployment generation of any kind 
Right, sir. So we have one last question from uh, Dr. Prachi. Mm -hmm. Sir, as you already discussed that cyber security is a, a major barrier for adopting industry revolution 4.2. So, sir, can you throw some more light on the same? Yeah, of course. <laughs> I mean, this, of course, this light can... You see, why uh, this calls for a much, uh, much uh, more fundamental uh, uh, relook. For example, why people resort to uh, cyber uh, is, uh, crime or cyber fraud? It is because the utmost concern for self and very little concern for others. So what we really need to address in the society, a fundamental change in the value system and attitude, that's what I bring in a part of global employability, that I do not flourish at the cost of others. And therefore, when people have values and attitudes, where they have a balanced concern for self and others, and not try I to flourish at the cost of others because the root cause of cyber uh, crime or cyber uh, fraud is where people like to flourish at the cost of others when without earning money they want to hoodwink the money from others hard earning by 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 by, by uh, getting an otp from them in a fraudulent manner so unless we have a fundamental change in the values and mindset and attitudes so that as a human society we must not flourish at the cost of others we must know that, uh, and therefore this calls for a fundamental uh, change in our education right from childhood, right from primary education, this cutthroat individualism perhaps has led to this situation where you knock out somebody else and therefore we really, unfortunately, re re our uh, national education policy in India 2020 addresses this issue, cutthroat individualism, that moving ahead of others and shortcut methods can cause problems because these cyber, uh, uh, you know, frauds, are attempt to shortcut uh, uh, earnings without working for it. So a fundamental change in the mindset not to flourish at the cost of others is what can prevent it. Until you prevent it, now use technology uh, to see that uh, you, uh, you, uh, you know, you call poke -okay system in Japanese language, which means even by mistake, you cannot commit a mistake. So develop a technology so that even by mistake, you cannot commit a cyber mistake. So, so use technology to prevent it till natural tendency of developing good human being by better bad attitudes would prevent the need for cyber crimes. Yes, it's, it's a major get to me. The biggest single uh, you know roadblock in implementing uh, cyber physical systems is cyber crime, cyber fraud, and unless we uh, we plug this issue, uh, perhaps it will be a major uh, roadblock in, in the process. Good, okay. Thank you so much, sir. Okay. I, I have survived my time frame anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, finally, I would like to uh, uh, propose a vote of thanks, and I would like to thank Professor Premrath for delivering the inaugural lecture uh, in this smart classroom here. Special thanks to Dr. Agda Benito and Dr. Lena Booth for helping me organize today's lecture and Professor uh, Nupur Prakash for being there uh, all the time. We would look forward to many more such se sessions in collaboration with ASU and other partner universities in future. Through, though the pandemic has stirred the education space, but it has also brought us all together virtually. We hope to see you all again, and thank you once again. Thank you all. Thank you. And it might interest you to know that I have a lecture class and 10 to 12 13 and see you now after this. So for so me, this was an really unscheduled engagement. Your and, uh, this lecture. Uh, I, uh, from 10 30 to 12 30, I will have my uh, scheduled lecture class in NCU. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, I'll apologize if I couldn't uh, meet your expectations, what you had from me, because it was a very short notice, uh, almost so you have with zero time. Our expectations. Thank you very so much. Thank, thank you for being much. there. All the best. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you.